Okay, great. Um, so let's get started again with the, uh, the, the rest of the morning session. So our next speaker is Doug Lowy, who's the director of the NCI. Um, as many of you know, he's done groundbreaking work understanding papillomaviruses and their connection to human cancer, and was heavily involved in the, uh, the uh, development of the HPV vaccine, which he will uh, tell us about today. Well, good morning, everyone. It really was a pleasure for me to be invited by uh, Tyler, Ed, and Nancy to come and talk today. Uh, I think the idea of having this symposium devoted to uh, prevention and screening is really very timely. And I'm going to talk with you uh, this morning really about an area that is critically important, which is the use of technology to address important medical problems and the example that I'm going to be giving really is that of the HPV vaccine. My disclosures are that I'm an inventor of the vaccine. The technology has been licensed to the two companies that make uh, commercial versions of the uh, vaccine. I'm going to discuss potential off-label uses of the vaccine, protecting against additional diseases uh, and giving fewer doses. And I also have been involved in some other uh, technology, which I will not be discussing. I'm dividing the presentation really into four parts. The implications of identifying HPV as the etiologic agent for cervical cancer and what this has led to. Then a little bit on the epidemiology of HPV-associated cancer. Then discussing the first and second generation preventive vaccines, the different aspects of that. And then finally, safely reducing the number of vaccine doses. In some ways, this is the most important slide that I'm going to show you, because basic research in the mid-1980s led to the identification of HPV 16 and 18 as major causes of cervical cancer by Harold Zerhausen and his colleagues, which led to his receiving the Nobel Prize in 2008. As a result of identifying the etiologic agent of a cancer, and that it was an infectious agent, a number of important milestones have subsequently been achieved. The natural history of HPV infection and pathogenesis of cervical cancer is understood in many ways, at least as well as that of any other cancer, as a result of knowing where it starts with the infection. There have also been identification of many non-cervical HPV-associated cancers. In the developing world, they are not very important. Cervical cancer predominates, as you will see on a slide. But in the United States, there are about 25,000 uh, HPV-associated cancers that occur each year, and about half of them are the non-cervical cancer, such as oropharynx cancer. And in addition, they're they uh, occur in men, about three quarters of them occur in men, rather than obviously cervical cancer is predominantly, if not exclusively, in women. I'm sorry, that was a joke. Uh, was, <laughs> uh, HPV based cervical cancer screening has also been an important area of development, which I won't have time to discuss. It's very likely to replace cytology for primary screening, and it really is much more sensitive uh, and has a lot of things to recommend itself over cytology, although, as Barry mentioned in the last presentation, cytology-based screening has had an enormous positive impact on reducing in incidence and mortality from cervical cancer. And the understanding of the molecular pathogenesis of cervical cancer is leading to the experimental analysis of ancillary tests that are currently understudied, such as P16, uh, which paradoxically is expressed in many precancers and in uh, cancers attributable to HPV infection, or methylation of specific sites in the viral genome, which also occurs. There's the theoretical possibility of therapeutic vaccines, antivirals, but this morning we're going to focus on the preventive vaccine. So a couple of slides about the epidemiology of HPV-associated cancer. This is really predominantly a cancer of poor women 
and because there are more poor women in the developing world than in the industrialized world, that's where a disproportionate number of these cancers uh, occur. As uh, shown here on this, on, on this slide, there are about uh, 160,000 women who die each year in the developing world compared to only about 17,000 in the industrialized world. And the uh, International Agency Against Cancer, if you do their projections, uh, the, in, in 15 years, there's not going, between here and here, there's not projected to be a uh, an increase in the number of cervical cancers. If anything, there might be a small decrease. But in the industrial, in the uh, developing world, this goes in over this seven-year period up to over 200,000, and in the next 15-year period to over 3,000. How can we try to change that? One way is with screening. Another is with uh, is with vaccination. Why is HPV vaccination recommended very early on in young adolescents? And the reason really is shown in this slide, which is taken from two different studies, where, which are virtually superimposable results, one in the United Kingdom, the other from the United States at the University of Washington with undergraduate women from the University of Washington. That one's in blue, and the UK is in red. These are women, their, their first sexual partner, and the women in this slide have had only one lifetime sexual partner. Within four months, one in five become uh, HPV infected. About half of them are with potentially oncogenic causing HPV. And within two years, uh, almost uh, one in two have become infected. Therefore, if you're going to be doing primary prevention, you want, in a most cost-effective way, to immunize women before they initiate uh, sexual activity. Now, what about the first generation uh, HPV vaccines? Uh, I don't do this alone, and I love this African uh, aphorism, if you want to go quickly, go alone, but if you want to go far, go together. And I have worked over the years with many wonderful uh, co uh, colleagues, and some of them are shown on this slide. I should particularly acknowledge John Schiller, with whom I've worked closely for more than 30 years. So since many of you are uh, steeped, as it were, in uh, targeted treatment uh, and uh, understanding uh, molecular abnormalities in cancer, I just want to point out that genes and proteins of oncogenic microbial agents, such as those in HPV, are as much molecular targets as BRAF, VGF receptor, et cetera. But microbial targets, such as those in hepatitis B virus, hepatitis C virus, and HPV, have theoretical translational advantages over cell encoded targets. One, they represent foreign genes and proteins, and in principle, it's easier to develop specific interventions against them than against cell encoded genes or proteins. And because they are foreign genes and proteins, serious side effects are less likely. Although, when it comes to primary prevention, as Barry was telling you with areas of screening, this is even just as much true. You don't want to be causing harm to people with vaccination uh, because the benefits are going to occur really downstream, only a minority of patients. The harms, however, tend to occur early. Precision medicine in primary prevention has a lot of theoretical advantages over precision medicine and cancer treatment. Most HPV infections are self-limited and confer some resistance to reinfection. And all you need to do with the vaccine is simply to mimic the main immune response that restricts reinfection. Historically, the population-wide use of preventive vaccines has lured, led to herd immunity, and it has not led to the development of resistant viral mutants. This is very different from treatment, either of infectious disease or treatment of cancer. And herd immunity, which is a decrease in the prevalence of an infectious agent within a population. I just want to make sure that you understand what I'm saying, where, because herd immunity, the decrease in prevalence, is really a key aspect of, of population-wide vaccination. What about the specific issues of trying to make a preventive vaccine against an oncogenic agent? First, 
licensed vaccines against microbial agents are mainly preventive, and the induction of neutralizing antibodies, that is the antibodies that interfere with infection, are usually most critical. Second, HPVs contain viral oncogenes, the famous uh, E6 and E7, but in addition, E5 also is an oncogene. And it implies that you'd be best off with a subunit vaccine that's lacking in the oncogenes because, especially if you're giving DNA, you wouldn't like to be giving oncogenic DNA to a normal population. Papillomaviruses encode two proteins that induce neutralizing antibodies, the two capsid proteins, L1 and L2. But it's L1 that contains the immunodominant neutralization epitopes. And importantly, they are confirmationally dependent. If you take a linear array of L1, you'll induce lots of antibodies, but you're not going to induce any neutralizing antibodies. And the linear L1 is useless as a vaccine. Our hypothesis was that L1 could self-assemble to make empty particles having a confirmation that induces high levels of neutralizing antibodies. And the way that Reinhard Kernbauer in the laboratory uh, did it initially was with a recombinant baculovirus into which he inserted uh, L1 and then, uh, and then produce this in insect cells, which led to spontaneous assembly of virus-like particles. If you will, this is nature's nanoparticles. And what we try to do is to understand how they work and how nature does this, and then to simply improve upon it by giving large doses to protect people. It induces high titers of uh, neutralizing antibodies, and uh, it's non-infectious and non-oncogenic. Non uh, I should point out that there were two papers in the peer review literature that said this approach did not work, but uh, we had the advantage of doing this with bovine papillomavirus, for which we had developed a neutralization assay in contrast to other people which had been focused initially on HPV. And there was no neutralization assay for HPV, and it was not uh, it was really a problem because it turned out that the HPV that the people in the world had been using was a mutant. And so we identified what the mutation was and solved the problem. And so actually we're able to get efficient self-assembly uh, for HPV-16, which is the main, the most oncogenic of the HPV types. And so this was another technological advance uh, by trying to essentially understand the biological problem and uh, looking at it from a, in this case, from a genetic uh, perspective. So there were two first generation uh, vaccines. One is the, the, they're based on the virus-like particles. One is made by GlaxoSmithKline called Cervarix, and it has HPVs from 16 and 18, and uh, responsible for about 70% of cervical cancer and more than 90% of the non-cervical HPV positive uh, cancers. The uh, vaccine uh, that is sold mainly uh, here in the, in the United States is Gardasil made by Merck, and it's a quadrivalent vaccine. In addition to 16 and 18, it contains particles from 6 and 11, which together uh, account for about 90% of genital warts. Let me briefly summarize the phase three HPV vaccine trials. In uninfected patients, HPV vaccination can confer close to 100% protection against incident persistent infection and disease attributable to the HPV vaccine types. Basically, it prevents new infection. The vaccine can also protect against non-cervical infection and disease while screening uh, on a population-wide basis thus far is only for cervical cancer. There's limited cross-protection against non-vaccine HPV types, and importantly, the vaccine does not alter the natural history of prevalent or established infection, i.e., it is not therapeutic. The initial population-wide impact of HPV vaccination, it can be seen most uh, interestingly, I think, uh, by looking at genital warts 
uh, in women and men in Australia. And that's uh, shown in, uh, after this slide uh, in the next two slides. The goals of vaccination are first, obviously, to reduce the risk of infection and disease in vaccinees. But the second uh, goal is also to indirectly reduce the risks by reducing the prevalence of the vaccine types in the general population. So vaccine types would be 6, 11, 16, and 18, for example, with the quadrivalent vaccine. And those are data shown here. In the vertical uh, black dotted line is 2007, when the vaccination was uh, started in, uh, in Australia. And what you can appreciate is with this green-blue line in the young women, uh, within three years of initiating uh, the vaccine program, this is looking at, uh, at, at all comers, uh, dramatic decrease in, uh, genital, in genital warts. For the 30-year-old women in the green interrupted line, no significant difference. They were not vaccinated. Uh, and 21 to 30 uh, in between the under 21 and the 30. The really dramatic result, however, is seen with the, uh, with the males. These are heterosexual males. During this time period, the males were not vaccinated. So again, this very sh sharp drop in the number uh, in the incidence of genital warts is really attributable to herd immunity. The prevalence of uh, HPV six of HPV six and eleven, uh, which causes the genital warts, went down, and there are direct data to show that. And then, so the males were not exposed, and therefore a big uh, decrease. Again, in the green lines, no statistically significant decrease. Those who uh, were older than 30, and in between with the red interrupted line for those between 21 and 30. In the United States, we have not had as high uptake of the HPV vaccine as in Australia. But even here, there has been a decrease in the prevalence of the oncogenic HPV types that are specifically targeted by the vaccine. This is from uh, Lori Markowitz and her colleagues at the CDC who uh, looked at a population-wide survey, first in the, ten, in the three years before the vaccine was introduced. By the way, this uh, week marks the 10th anniversary of the FDA approval of, uh, of uh, the Merck vaccine. And this was looking between uh, 2009 to 2012, that is three, starting three years after the vaccine was approved. And although in the 14 to 19 year old girls, only a half of them had received one or more doses, there actually was a 61% decrease in the prevalence of HPV 16 and 18, which as I mentioned, are responsible for about 70% of cervical cancer, more than 90% of the non-cervical HPV associated cancers. And one of the nice things is with uh, HPV, you can uh, also look at the HPV types uh, in, in the genital tract that are not targeted specifically by the vaccine, and there's only a 10% decrease. This may be, at least in part, attributable to some cross-protection. Uh, what about the mechanism of action? In some ways, this is an important conundrum. How does systemic administration of three doses of the vaccine lead to uh, strong protection against a local mucosal, or for the, in the area of genital warts, a local uh, genital cutaneous uh, infection? And we think that there are three main reasons. First, the repetitive structure of the virus-like particle immunogen is intrinsically immunogenic. And you actually can use this uh, repetitive structure to overcome B cell tolerance to uh, self antigens by, uh, with, uh, with other approaches. Because the virus-like particle technology has a lot of implications uh, for other diseases beyond that of papillomaviruses. Second, tissue-associated neutralizing antibodies are exudated at potential sites of infection. And what it means is that the antibody levels at this, these sites reflect their level in the serum rather than their lower level in the non-disrupted genital tract. And I'll show you uh, an animated cartoon of that in two more slides. And, th and third, uh, HPV is highly susceptible to neutralizing antibodies. 
How do we know that information? And the way that we know it is really through experimentation. Uh, uh, John and, and, and I and our colleagues, particularly Jeff Roberts, a number of years ago, developed a mouse challenge model uh, for, for, for the genital tract for HPVs using a different technology, which is basically making pseudoviruses, which have the authentic papillomavirus coat and encoding a reporter pr uh, protein in the encapsulated uh, pseudogenome. And you can measure the development of genital uh, inf infection in the, in the mice. Either you can use luciferase, you can use red fluorescent protein, and see it really in situ what happens. We also found that the virus, instead of going first uh, and binding to the target cell, actually binds directly to the basement membrane and then goes to the target cell. This shows you the outline of the HPV-16 pseudotype in the genital tract of the, uh, of the, of the mouse. And this shows you laminin-5, which, uh, which outlines the basement membrane. If you don't disrupt the genital tract, nothing, nothing binds. And so this is clear, direct demonstration that microtrauma is very important. And that'll be uh, important in one more slide. The neutralizing antibodies, as shown by this reconstruction uh, cryo-electron micrograph of, a, of neutralizing antibodies decorated on the right half of this, uh, of, of this uh, virion, it's very easy to understand how when you have high titers of antibodies, it will interfere with infection. And that's shown here. In an immunized uh, individual, there's lots of antibodies in the tissue, but in the intact genital tract, the antibody levels are low. But in order to get infection, you need to either mechanically or uh, physically disrupt the uh, uh, epithelium so that the basement membrane is exposed. And when that happens, the antibodies in the tissue go up into this site of potential infection so that when the virus particle comes in, before it binds to the basement membrane, you get uh, the binding of the antibodies, and you don't get the binding to the basement membrane, nor do you get the transfer to the target uh, epithelium. And we've worked this out uh, in some detail using this animal model, which, by the way, uh, precisely predicts uh, in, the, in the mice, uh, from the data in the mice, what happens uh, in women. Now, what about a second generation uh, vaccine, which has recently been developed? And the goal here is to protect against a larger number of HPV types. This is especially important for cervical cancer, but less so for the non-cervical cancers, because HPV 16 and 18 so predominate in the non-cervical cancers. This shows you the uh, what you get, essentially, 16 alone accounting for about half of cervical cancer. When you add 18, about 70%. Uh, what Merck has done is to take the next five most common types uh, and to add it to make a nine-valent vaccine. And uh, this, uh, in principle, can protect against close to 90% of potentially oncogenic uh, infections. And in phase three clinical trials, uh, when they used as the uh, comparator was Gardasil, that is the quadrivalent vaccine, there were 27 uh, cervical, uh, serious cervical infections attributable to the five new types in the patients who received Gardasil, but there was only one infection uh, of that kind in the women who received the uh, nonovalent or the, or the nine-valent uh, vaccine. When I talked with you initially about the quadrivalent vaccine, I should have pointed out to you that Ed Skolnick was really in charge of the scientific research at Merck at a time when Merck decided to go forward to develop the HPV vaccine. And his contribution to this area really should be a, a, a acknowledged and celebrated. There are still a few uh, HPV types that aren't protected, but we're really talking about uh, probably taking uh, cervical cancer from being a public health problem to no longer being a public health problem. But it will take a while because this is primary prevention. The last area that I want to discuss is uh, how one or two vaccine doses may actually be sufficient. 
Uh, the vaccine in the United States is approved just for three, uh, but for three doses. But Merck has recently completed uh, two doses in young adolescent boys and girls separated by six months with Gardasil 9. The results are positive in terms of immunogenicity, and they have gone to the FDA to ask for approval for two doses. And it, uh, the FDA is likely to give an answer by the end of the year. So we might be at two doses uh, by the end of the year in, in the United States. The, uh, European Medicines Agency, both Merck and GlaxoSmithKline a few years ago, based on immunogenicity data in those uh, vaccines, went to the European Medicines Agency to ask for approval for two doses in young adolescents. And so it was approved there, and the World Health Organization now recommends uh, two doses for young adolescents on a worldwide basis, but that's not yet standard of care in the United States. The NCI has conducted a vaccine trial of the GlaxoSmithKline vaccine that started several years before the vaccine was approved by the FDA. And I want to show you some unexpected results that we think are uh, going to lead to at least a large clinical trial to see whether one dose might be sufficient. These data show you that among the women who uh, were in the trial, a fair number of them, uh, for one reason or another, only received two doses or one dose. But when we followed them, their uh, efficacy uh, receiving one or two doses was, was not inferior to that of the women who received all three doses. And this is post hoc analysis. So it was not a pre-specified outcome. So you wouldn't want to change practice based on this. But in terms of thinking about this in a trial, it was still during the blinding period. And importantly, the uh, control groups, the rate of infection was very similar, whether the women received three doses. Here it's a, li a little over 7%. Uh, 6% with two doses, and 8%. This is for HPV 16 and, infection, uh, and 18 uh, combined. And uh, we've recently uh, analyzed the international trials of the GlaxoSmithKline vaccine uh, and come up with qualitatively similar results. What was even more surprising, given that this is a subunit vaccine, was that one dose of the vaccine actually led to stable antibody levels uh, for the entire four-year period of the vaccine. This is the women who would be naturally infected with HPV 16, and these levels are about five times higher. And just remember, no cases of HPV occurred in the women who received only one dose. Obviously, two and three doses, you get even higher titers. But our working hypothesis is that this uh, level is, uh, is sufficient. Uh, similar data were also seen for HPV 18. So we're moving towards a randomized controlled trial to test the efficacy of a single vaccine dose. And here's the rationale of why we're, tr uh, we're doing this. First, there is no precedent for one dose of a protein-based subunit vaccine to induce stable antibody titers for several years. And we think that this may be attributable to uh, especially to the high immunogenicity of the virus-like particles. The hepatitis B virus vaccine is also uh, thought to be a VLP vaccine, but it has a lipid coat associated with it, whereas the virus-like particles for HPV are, are essentially naked. It's just, the, it's just the protein coat, and this might be a qualitative difference because many people, after they're immunized, even with uh, several doses of, HP, of the HBV vaccine, their titers fall off. There's also uh, a proprietary adjuvant in Cervix, which uh, has a TLR4 agonist. So the plan at the NCI is to do a randomized controlled trial to rigorously test the efficacy 
of one dose. And the NCI and Gates Foundation are supporting this, and we're going to test two commercial vaccines, one with alum and one with ASO4, and that will be the GSK vaccine. It will be a large trial uh, because it has to be a non-inferiority trial because you can't do a placebo-controlled trial. It's unethical uh, 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 to do that. But we think that it's worthwhile because if one dose were to work, it would have substantial implications. First, you could think about from a cost and logistics perspective of really vaccinating all uh, each birth cohort uh, in the world, but it also would suggest that virus-like particle vaccines are something to be thought of for new vaccines uh, going forward. So let me summarize what I think are kind of the three main points that I was trying to make uh, this morning. Basic research led to the identification of HPV as the cause of several cancers and to various downstream or subsequent information, including development of the vaccine. Second generation vaccines with activity against a broader range of HPV types can achieve the greatest reduction in HPV associated disease. And third, the high immunogenicity of the vaccines means long-term protection can be induced with fewer than three doses. This tells you kind of what happens. You identify a cause. It happens to be an infectious one. And you can really generate an enormous amount of basic translational and clinically useful uh, information as a direct consequence. Thanks very much. And uh, looking forward to the rest of the symposium and the panel.